Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I think my job is made easier by the two brilliant presentations from Oliver Trexer and uh, Pali Oster. What I'm going to talk about is basically reiterating what has already been said. We know that uh, urotroscopy has become a standard urological procedure. I think the miniaturization of the scopes, the use of laser, the use of flexible urotroscope, and the availability of all the accessories that we have an access to at the moment has made uh, urotroscopy as, as a universal procedure for all urethral stones and probably for majority of the renal stones as well. We know that it's an extremely versatile procedure. I mean, it can be done where all other endourological procedures fail. For example, lithotripsy and PCNL could not be done in situations where you have major spinal deformities, where you have bleeding diathesis. We know a lot of our patients are on anticoagulants these days, and it's difficult to take them off from anticoagulants. And in a situation like this, percutaneous surgery and lithotripsy are, are relative contraindications. Urotroscopy is versatile, but urotroscopy is associated with complications. And we have traditionally been classifying these complications into major and minor complication. The dividing line is rather arbitrary. And the dividing line is really whether we require a surgical procedure or an intervention to deal with these complications. And they are, they are thus by termed as major complications. For most other complications, which can be managed medically or by conservative means, are called minor complications. And we are all aware of most of these complications. More recently, we have been able to objectively stratify these complications so that when we talk of literature and we talk about comparison of complications coming from various series, from various people doing urotroscopies, we know that we are talking the same language. And uh, the modified Clavian classification system is one way, and if you look at the grade one and grade two complications are the one which we can easily classify as, as uh, the uh, the major, com the minor complications, whereas anything between three and five are major complications. Fortunately, there uh, is no reported five complication as yet. Uh, Mandel et al. look at the semi-rigid urotroscopy and classified complications based upon the modified Clavian system. And in this recent report, if you look at the overall complication rate, we see that 30%, and 30% may probably mean very little, because if, if you look at only a 30% figure, we are seeing it's a pretty highly morbid procedure. But if you look at closely, and if you look at the modified Clavin classification system, we see that 98% of them have been one to three complications, and uh, there was hardly any grade four complication. So, in vast majority of patients, these complications were managed conservatively. More recently, uh, Sean Thaler, and this is what uh, Pali Oster has also alluded to, about uh, the grading of the urethral injuries or mucosal injuries, and this post-urotroscopy urethral lesion score is, is, I hope, will become another standard way of grading something that we see very frequently, and we have very little idea of how to document it. And I think this, this will become the standard way in the near future. He will be presenting his data in the forthcoming European Association meeting. Uh, in their analysis, they've seen that the grade O comp uh, urethral injuries were only were seen in 46 percent grade one in 30 percent, and grade two in about 19 percent. It's a grade three which actually requires some form of intervention, and they were seen only in 4 percent of patients. And there was significant high inter-rate reliability in terms of grading these complications. Coming back uh, to our list of major complication, and this is what is the most devastating thing that can happen to anyone who is doing a urotroscopy, a urethral avulsion injury. Uh, Stroller and Wolf uh, reviewed 5,000 cases of urotroscopy. Uh, all of them must be semi-rigid or rigid urotroscopies, and the urethral avulsion rate was 0.3%. Uh, 
similar analysis on, on, on 1,000 patients between the period of 1992 and 1998 showed no urethral avulsion injuries. And I think it's, it's quite obvious to all of us who are doing quite a huge number of ureteroscopies that the urethral avulsion injury has almost disappeared, fortunately. Why it used to happen? Uh, I think there are just two reasons. Uh, in order to, to advance to the urethral stone, we may be advancing the ureteroscope with a force uh, which is just beyond the ureter to handle. Or uh, the other situation is that you're trying to extract a stone grabbed in a basket which is too big for the ureter. Auden uh, recently looked at three cases of what he called as a scabbard avulsion, uh, a very dramatic term, but I think for a very dramatic condition. Uh, in, in, in all these three situations, the urologist was young and inexperienced, and he was trying to pull, push the ureter against resistance, and that resulted in avulsion injury. But I think what has made the difference in the last 10 years is that our scopes have become thinner, finer. Uh, I remember doing a ureteroscopy 15 years back with an 11.5 French, and we used to do a lot of things, including giving hyoscine butyl bromide, et cetera, et cetera, and obviously nothing used to, to, used to work. And I'm very happy to uh, listen to Pale's work on use of uh, uh, agents in the irrigation itself which obviously will significantly decrease the systemic complications and probably will, may work as well. Our experience have increased and we know and we are aware of these complications and I think these are the major two reasons for decreasing two major injuries, avulsion and susception. The management obviously is, is very traumatic. It is conversion of a daycare ureteroscopy into a major open or laparoscopic surgical procedure you may end up doing an nephrectomy. You may end up doing some reconstructive procedure depending upon the extent of injury, which include ileal interpositioning, transuretral ureterostomy, or Bowery's flap, et cetera. Intersusception, which is relatively much more, uh, much less common than even the avulsion injury, is the invagination of the mucosal sleeve, which results in partial circumferential injury of the ureteral mucosa and the traction of this mucosa within the ureteral lumen. Uh, it can be both in anti-grade and retrograde procedures. Again, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rare thing. I think what has really made the difference is our ability to teach our residents and ourselves in doing a safe procedure and in which uh, the simulation, the Euromantor, and the experience, they all are, are contributory. Unfortunately, we still do not have a surrogate marker to determine when the resident is ready to go and do it on a patient. And I think we need to have uh, some models in which we can actually certify our residents to be able to go and do it on the patient itself. Uh, so from model, they have to move, and the most important thing is working in a high volume center, and that probably will uh, increase their ability to do a safe ureteroscopy. Ureteral perf perforations are relatively more frequent than major urethral injuries. Uh, the incidence variable because we do not have a standardized reporting system. It's really related to the size of the scope. It's also related to the intracorporeal shock wave or other fragmentation devices that we use. It's also related to the guide wire. And something, this is one part of the ureteroscopy, which is a relatively blind procedure. It's only under fluoroscopy guidance. Sometimes we try and be enthusiastic in chasing a stone which has gone into a minor perforation on the urethral mucosa and we make this minor urethral mucosal injury into a major injury. The only thing that you need to do in a situation like this is probably just to leave the stone where it is, document it, so that the other urologist doesn't go and chase for that stone. The false passage in mucosal abrasion, which I said, is, is more related to the guide wire. Uh, Margaret Pearl call it that you have that tacky sensation when you're passing the guide wire, which is different from when the guide wire is flopping through the lumen of the ureter. And when you do a uh, fluoroscopy, you see that the guide wire, although going up, is not rolling into the renal pelvis as it should. Extravasation, again, is important because extravasation uh, is, is relatively common. 
uh, urine extravasate, the irrigation fluid extravasate, the blood, and all these can result in abscess formation, and which can subsequently result in periurethral fibrosis and stricture. And it has significant long-term consequences. Contrast and stone can also go out. It is important that we should uh, distinguish embedded stone versus an extruded stone. And an embedded stone is something that you can take care of by incising the mucosa with your laser fiber and subsequently drawing the stone within the urethral lumen and fragmenting it. Bleeding is relatively common, but fortunately the bleeding is often always, always minor and it only makes your vision poor. It does not really have any long consequences. The stone fragmentation device related injuries are again, could be thermal injuries, uh, relatively more common with the old Andy Yag laser, which has a significant penetration depth of five to six millimeter, which again for a small urethral lumen is, is, is a long distance. Uh, electrohydraulic, which is hardly used now, again was associated. Holmium Yag has the advantage that it is a small thermal zone and it is absorbed by water, and as a consequence, the holmium yaglate related thermal injuries to the ureter are relatively less frequent. In a comparison of uh, holmium yag versus pneumatic lithotripsy, Bepath and colleague noted that retropulsion is the only difference between pneumatic lithotripsy and, uh, and holmium yag. The holmium yag has significant advantage because it results in earlier uh, stone free rate. It is associated with less mean operative time. However, there are some problems with holmium yag as well. Uh, as has been talked about in the last two days, that uh, the size of the fiber can have a significant impact on the deflection of your ureteroscope. And for most of us, we are using a flexible ureteroscope for the lower pole caliceal stone. And if you have a 365 micrometer fiber, it can decrease your deflection of the scope by 24 to 45%. If you have 200 micron fiber, then about 10 to 20% uh, decrease in the degree of deflection is there. So it's, it's important, uh, as has all been pointed out yesterday as well, they try and use the smaller fiber than the big fibers. Potential scope damage because of accidental uh, firing of the laser within or close to the scope is something that we have all seen, talked about socially. And uh, there are various ways of preventing that. Uh, most of these work in some hand, doesn't work in all the situations. The, another important problem that we face is the stone fragment retropulsion something that is relatively more frequent with pneumatic device than with the laser, but it does happen with laser as well. Now, what does it do? It increases your operating time, it increases the morbidity of the procedure, it may increase the cost of the procedure, and it may result in conversion of semi-rigid retroscopy to flexible or use of uh, extracorporeal lithotripsy. There are various uh, stone trapping strategies and devices which have been described and, and we are all aware of most of these devices. More recently, uh, we described uh, a, a cheap alternative of backstop. We have been using lubricating gel, uh, injecting it just proximal to the urethral stone, and this was a randomized control trial that we reported in Journal of Urology some four years back. And uh, in this study, there is a significant difference between the control and the study group in which you can see the stone uh, retropulsion rate and subsequently the stone free rate was significantly different in the study group. It only involves putting one to two ml of KY gel uh, just proximal to the ureteroscope using your five French open-ended catheter or just bypassing the stone with the ureteroscope and putting it through the working channel. Uh, Pale has talked about this in great detail and brilliantly looked at this factor of urosepsis, which can be a result of an infective stone or external pathogens introduced during urotroscopy plus forceful irrigation. And the pyelolymphatic backflow can convert a simple urinary tract infection 
into a sepsis, which, which is again is great, uh, Clavin's grade two complication. Use of preoperative antibiotics uh, is, is something that is recommended in most cases. Postoperative antibiotics uh, in complicated cases should always be given. And the caution is for anybody who's starting urotroscopy that make sure that your urine sterile before the procedure, antibiotic prophylaxis, judicious irrigation, and keeping the intrarenal pressure as low as possible to keep a good vision, able to do the procedure, and uh, do not result in significant pyelolymphatic backflow. This study uh, reported about four years back looking at the continuous and the conventional, uh, continuous flow versus conventional ureteroscope, and as you can see that uh, the level of the irrigation fluid can be increased without significantly increasing the intrarenal pressure. And I think these and some of the other small ways of uh, dealing with these things, we are able to avoid major complications. Well, just uh, summarizing the risk factors for semi-rigid ureteroscopy, is stone above the ischial spine, stones which are greater than five millimeters, dilated proximal ureter, kidneys that fail to excrete, and all these things result in significant complications, and, and these are the things that you're aware of before you're going in. And if, if your mind is ready to understand that these potential complications can take place, you can be a little more careful in avoiding them. Impacted stone, something that we do encounter quite frequently in our practice. If it is above the iliac crest, again, the stone free rate chances are less and the complication chances are higher. Uh, Demetri and uh, colleagues have looked into and they identified two factors, which is surgical time, which is also alluded to, and the success of the procedure are the two factors which uh, contribute in complication rate. Preoperative stenting, something that has been discussed. And I think for most cases, it is, it is really not required to, with the kind of ureteroscopes that are available to us, both in the semi-rigid and the flexible, that uh, you, you do not really need to do preoperative stenting. However, you need to caution your patient, uh, the non-stented group, that there may be a possibility of going in again. Access sheet, uh, this, is, this is an area of an active interest. There was a great enthusiasm with the use of, for the use of axis sheath with the initial introduction of, uh, of flexible ureteroscopy. And obviously, the pro factors are that rapid, repeated, and atraumatic access to the upper track. It's cost effective because it significantly decreases the chances of uh, uh, injury to the ureteroscope. It keeps the intrarenal pressure low. However, there are problems, and the problems are that there is unnecessary shear force applied to the distal ureter. The size of the axis sheath could be at least 10, 12, 13, 15, 14, 16. And all these sizes are relatively big for the naive ureter. And this may result in decreasing the blood flow in the mucosa of the ureter, which can subsequently has a potential of resulting in, in stricturing in the, in, 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 in the future. And the other problem, obviously, is that you cannot place access sheet in, in all cases. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, uh, ureteroscopy is the most common cause of ureteral trauma. It's something that we don't realize. As a urologist, we are the source of uh, the ureteral trauma. Uh, these complications, but fortunately, most of these complications are minor, MCS, MCSC class type 1 and type 2. The factors which have uh, contributed is the instrumentation and the technique. And this is something that both can be modified easily. Caution that it's important that we pay attention to details. Instrument selection is important. And an ideal situation is that the complication should be due to the underlying pathology rather than the treatment itself. Thank you very much for your attention.